What makes us think we're right? Is there a proof? And in fact, I'm asking us this question, but let me open it up. If we're Baptists, if we're Seventh-day Adventists, if we're Buddhists or Hindus or Aztec sun god worshipers, how do any of us know whether we're right? And in fact, open it up a little bigger and say, is there any religious or political or cultural people group across the face of the earth who was intentionally wrong? Or didn't they all think they're right? So if all of those guys can be deceived, isn't it possible that we're deceived? Isn't it possible that he is still deceived preaching this word compared to the word that he might have been preaching 20 years ago? So what calibration mechanism do we have to hold up to his words as a standard? If he was talking a distance, I could pick up a tape measure. If he was talking about time, I might be able to pick up a, a calendar. Did the creator of heaven and earth provide human beings some sort of standard of measure by which we can take words, ideas, doctrines, and compare them to see whether we fit the standard? He mentions being a carpenter. In carpentry, you can use what's called a whiskey stick. It's a, it's a piece of wood or metal and has a bubble. And if they use whiskey, it's so it doesn't freeze. So it, nowadays they have lasers, but the lasers will have this little button which locks the laser. You can pick up this laser and stick it there and, and it'll shine a dot. And you might think, oh, this is straight. And you stand back and go, that doesn't look straight. And you look and like, oh, I forgot to take the lock off, the button off the laser. And so all of a sudden it sets the, the, the laser into free motion so it'll, it'll wait and find perfect level. So what I'm saying is that if the, if the bubble level is, has, is frozen a bit, it'll lie to you. If the laser level still has the lock on, it'll lie to you. If somebody has busted or drooped up the end of the tape measure, it'll lie to you by an eighth of an inch, which if you're doing finish work, that's a pretty big deal. So let's not assume that the standard of measure we have is the, the spirit within us. I, I've heard that the Mormons have a, a way of calibrating. They say there's a burning in the bosom. Everybody thinks that the Holy Spirit is telling them that they're on the right track. How do you know you got the right Holy Spirit? I know that a bunch of people believe that the Holy Spirit condones going to church on Sunday. Well, guess what? It's not a crime to go to church on Sunday. The criminal act, according to the Torah, is not sitting down on Shabbat. Right. You can go to church, go to gathering, or read the Bible, or fellowship any day of the week. That's not the issue. So the question is, how do you know you've got the right Holy Spirit speaking to you? How do we know? Where is the standard of measure? Does anybody have an idea of where is that plumb line, as it were? Now, a plumb line in carpentry is where you'll take from on high and you'll drop a string with a weight. Because of the physics of the earth, whether or not it's gravity or electromagnetism or flat or spherical, that's a different matter. But the point is, something is going to pull that string down, and we have learned that when that string is hanging, unless the wind is blowing, you can bet that that string is going to tell you perfect verticality. Now, there's a certain word in Hebrew which is a picture of that. But if you don't read Hebrew, you have no idea that word even exists. It happens to be the first word of Exodus 20 used in the Ten Commandments, which is Anoki. In, in the Paleo, it, it would be written like uh, Aleph, Nun, Kav, Yo. It's simply translated I am. It's like, where do you get a plumb line out of I am? Or you could say it means to, like the, the pronoun letter I in English, that's vertical. So you could say this means to reference the vertical. 
How? How does that mean reference the vertical? This letter, Aleph, basically kind of means I am or I will, but what about the rest of these? The Yod is, so mentioned as a suffix, basically means my, so it's referential of the one who's speaking or perhaps of the word, but that, that puts these two letters in the middle as kind of the essence of the word, knock. Knock. Well, in English, if you want to discount price, of an appliance, you go to the nick and dent department, right? It's, it's been knocked around and might have a big footprint in the door of the dishwasher or something. It still works, but it's, it's been marred. It's been reduced in value. Just so happens that the same phonetic knock or nick, if you look in the Hebrew dictionary, it says to be reduced in value. But it also means, anak means plumb line. So, my plumb line would be anak e, something that's been diminished or reduced, or like you take a plumb line from up on high and you let it drop down. Well, there's another word that also means to be hanged down or dropped down or diminished, and I'm hanging down like this because that's what the word means. The word means to be poor or weary or uh, or something like you pick up a mop and the, it's, it's kind of like wet mop strings and it's like, it, it just looks like it's hanging up. And that word is Bilal, Dalit Lamed Lamed. Just for what it's worth, one way to mess around with Hebrew is that if you take the second letter and duplicate it to be the third, it's just another variation of the same word. It's the word Dal. And if I put Dalit Lamed Hey, or Dalit Lamed Tav, or perhaps even Dalit Lamed Aleph, it's all the same thing. Those are various suffix endings. I could even write a Dalit Lamed Bob, and whether or not those are real words, you'd have to look up in the dictionary. But I'm saying, it's just like in English, if I say run, or ran, or running, or run, <laughs> you know, we're just adding, I done run, you know, it's just a, I run, ran, run, but I'm just saying, they're just forms of how the language works. This word Dalal means to be impoverished, weakened, diminished in value, the same word as the word not. So if, if Yeshua says, I'm the door, that's the word Dalit, which is a form of the word Dalal. But if we are hearing in English, we just say, oh, he's talking about, he's that thing with a handle and hinges that you open up to enter. Well, sure, that's what it means. But another way to read this is that some diminishment has happened, reduced in value, reduced in prestige or esteem, reduced in what? Well, it's kind of the same as the word anak, where you take something up here, like the big shot on the, on the hill that lives in the mansion, boy, if I could just get to him, you know, the guy who's running the show and causing life to be difficult for everybody else. Well, whoever, whatever deity, you know, some people I remember here saying, it's like, if there really is a God, he's a big stupid jerk who doesn't do what he says, and why does he allow the torment and the pain and the misery? Why doesn't he intervene? And gosh, we could just get to him. That's kind of the Aleph. The word Aleph, to write it in English, A-L-E-F, or perhaps even P-H, is similar to where we get the word aloof. If you're aloof, that means you're high and out of reach. It's the same word. That guy who's high and out of reach will drop something down like a plumb line, which happens to be a Dalal, reduced in value. It's like you're up here and you got a bucket of snakes and you go, oh, you can't touch me. Well, why would you take off any armor on your hand and stick it down into the bucket of snakes where they can bite you? Well, that's essentially what Dalal is. Reduced from your aloof position to be weakened and impoverished and made vulnerable like an impoverished, poor, diminished, tired, weary, where you can get beat up. Well, that's in the words, so for Yeshua to say, I'm the Dalit, and we translate, oh, he claimed to be the door, but it's also him claiming to be that one which was dropped down from the aloof on high, 
and made vulnerable to be beat up by the likes of us down here. That's one way of reading. But here you have this word that means plumb line. And that plumb line is the first word, Anoki, I am, it goes on to say, Anoki Yahuwah El Heka. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who, well, I'm the guy who just took you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I took you out of that servitude and slavery, and now you're my personal possession, my responsibility, and because you're my responsibility, I'm now going to impose upon you certain responsibilities. But yet, if you don't sign up for that agreement, if you don't consent to that dynamic relationship, well, then it doesn't involve you. So you could say, well, the Ten Commandments are for everybody on the face of the earth, and it's like, maybe they're not. After all, it's the first word of the Ten Commandments, he says, I am the guy who just took you out of that bondage, and now you're my personal possession that I will take care of, and now I'm going to impose upon you certain requirements, and you can say, hey, I didn't sign up for those requirements. Well, then those Ten Commandments are not yours. I heard a preacher recently, a few times I've heard him on the radio, I've heard him on YouTube, where they say the Ten Commandments has nothing to do with the Christian covenant, the New Testament church, the present day apostolic third day kingdom era, whatever you want to call it, it has nothing to do with us. Is that true? Yes. You're right. If they declare that they don't consent to that contractual agreement, it really doesn't have anything to do with them. Are they still saved? You're right. That's a different contract. The point is, how do we know what the truth is and how do we know whether that particular matter that we choose to regard as truth, does it even matter? So, this is kind of a different subject than what I was going to talk about, but let me ask you this. This word talking about a plumb line, if I could say, is there a standard of measure that the Almighty has given us by which we can reference whether a certain doctrine is true or not, it's that type of tool. Like a plumb line is a tool. If I'm going to stand this pillar up here, and I want to know whether that's perfectly level, I can go get a plumb line and hold it up and measure the distance up here and the message that, okay, that thing's plumb. Or I can use a whiskey stick, a level, or I can use a laser. Okay, can anybody think of, forget the Ten Commandments for a minute, we're not going to talk about the Ten Commandments. I was just relating it to that so you'd understand what I'm saying. Did the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, did he give us some mechanism, some means, some reference, whether we can apply it to what Shaul just told us, or what the preacher over there at the biggest church in the world in South Korea with you know, 50,000 members, or the guy in Lakewood, Texas, or the guy in Columbus, Ohio. How do we take anybody's message and compare it to what? Is there a device, a standard, a measurement, an instrument that he gave us? What does anybody think? Amen. What? Amen. Amen is the word truth. So the question is, is there a way to calibrate truth? What's the device? The law. The, the what? The law. The well, the, the law, like I referenced to the Ten Commandments, other people say that's not theirs. And so we can't use something which is not theirs to measure whether they're telling us the truth. <coughs> right? So in other words, we could say, hey, if you don't like the Ten Commandments, you're not one of us who do regard the Ten Commandments, but I can't say that they don't line up with the truth if there's some other truth they're talking about. I can only say if I'm, if I'm going to hold the Ten Commandments as truth, I can say does what they say line up with the Ten Commandments, but we're talking about any issue of truth. In other words, I'm trying to open this up to a greater, a greater humanity, you might say, and, and say, did he give humans... In other words, somebody from Israel can walk up to somebody from Ethiopia or somebody from Greenland or somebody from wherever and they say, hey, you should be like me. And they say, sorry, we already got some of that. We already have information. We already have priests. We already have doctrines. And if the person says, oh, no, but ours is better, by what standard is it better? 
So if the Christian church says, which I've heard them say, I've been a Christian my whole life, I don't claim to be one at the moment, just for what it's worth, but they say, we have the truth. Jesus Christ claimed to be the truth, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the truth. How do you prove them wrong, or are they wrong? What, what do you compare them to? If they say, this is a foot, by whose standard? The, the tape measure will read about that. It used to be in the olden days, if there was a king, the king's foot was the standard of measure. You get a big king or a short king, and you're going to have a different measure. So they changed them all the time. Just like empires would change calendars and say year zero is when the empire came to be. Then they standardized the worldwide calendar system. But, but by, I'm saying, is there an objective standard by which we can, we humans, can take any philosophy, any doctrine, any scripture interpretation and say, is that true? You're raising your hand. What, what's your take on the matter? I'm trying to take advantage of the game. I go back to the Torah again. I mean, Yahweh created the earth in the beginning. And he gave his laws, that is the truth. And if we accept it and as the truth, that is our problem. Okay, but if you go to the Greeks, they'll say it was Zeus. If you go to the Romans, they'll say it was well, Jove. If you go wrong. to somebody else. But it's not the Torah. I'm sorry, I would say they're wrong. Okay, what makes you think the Torah is right? Hey, we have to um, arrive at some kind of assumption or belief or faith or the truth. Okay, so you can choose to believe the Torah is the is accurate, but where's the proof that the Torah is accurate? All right, none of us know. Tell us. <laughs> okay, see, here's an interesting answer. I've asked a couple preachers this question: Is there a device? And they say, No, we just choose to believe. Yes. Love. But even a heathen can love. Well, to a point, yeah. Okay, so the question is. If you believe the truth, when like I would what, say heathen, I would go against people, go out of my way to yeah. cause a bad day. Why would I would say heathen? But now I'll go out of my way to show love to people. So the love is the evidence or the expression of the fact that you really believe what you believe. But what I'm saying is, could you believe something wrong and still be loving? Yeah, yes. sure. So, Could you believe just about anything and still think it's true? Yeah. 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 What's, yeah. Spiritual governance and creation. What, what does that mean? Could you elaborate? Spiritual governance and creation. So that what I'm trying to tell you is that the answer you just told me is so vague to me, I can imagine what I think you said, but I don't know what you said. So I need to ask you to clarify, to give me your mind directly communicated to me, because otherwise I could say, oh, I know what he's talking about, and I could say blah, 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 but it's not at all what he's talking about. He's going to have to know, no, wait, stop, that's not what I meant. So, so here's the question. There's the rising of the sun, the going down of the sun. There's, there's wind. What's the evidence of wind? Trees moving. I mean, there's a lot, yeah, that means there's an invisible force. So he's speaking to us through his creation. Okay, so here's, here's an interesting point. The almighty creator of heaven and earth, if he wanted to communicate to us and get the message across, just like I was asking him to do, he's going to have to bet that it's going to work. So he created our minds to be able to perceive, understand, make sense of patterns, words, images. If we see the trees moving, I could say, Am I in a puppet show? Is there somebody up there with strings pulling the string, pulling the leaves of the trees making you move? But we learn from when there were little children and say, no, when the trees are moving, you can pretty well bet the wind is blowing, though you can't see the wind. So he, the creator, has designed us to be able to put things together and come up with an answer that we can trust. Now he's got to be so clear in his methodology of communication that we're not going to end up in the wrong religion, the wrong philosophy, going to hell for having the wrong belief. But just because we believe it doesn't make it true. So what we're going to look at here is something that I think the Creator deposited for us to analyze and determine whether something is true or not. So this is going to take some 
engagement from y'all to contribute and try to remember, because I'm not going to take the time to write everything down in the interest of time. Let's suggest, let's say you were out walking in the wilderness. You were just out walking along, walking by the stream, taking a walk up by the mountains, and all of a sudden you see a big fence. Say that it has an interior compound. Say there's even a gate going into that fence. What does that make you think? What, where does your mind go when you come, you're just out there walking around and you, you see a fence? What, what is that, inf what information goes through your head? Why is it blocked off? Something is blocked off, okay, what? It's being protected. It's either blocked off or it's protected, what else? What's inside? Something's inside that's not outside, so it, now this is a separation mechanism. Who's this at? It belongs to somebody, so a fence must indicate possession versus not possession. It's a distinction between ownership of something, which is to say an exclusive, exclusive meaning only some people have access and other people don't. What, what else does anybody think of when they see a fence? Does it hurt if I touch it? <laughs> In other words, the concept of a fence has a threat to it. You could say, well, the sign doesn't say keep out or else. It could be just saying, would you leave this alone, please? But he's suggesting that it's like, man, if you cross over this fence, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something to make you wish you didn't. Either the fence itself or the owner of the fence. So he's now saying that this fence implies that there is an owner. So here I suggested, we were just walking out in the wilderness. It's like, I don't see any owner. Public lands, maybe, and... Boom, suddenly see a fence, and I'm like, whoa, everything's changed. Now somebody else, some phantom other, is claiming jurisdiction and ownership. Mm -hmm. Anything else come out of this picture? Restricted access to something that's precious. What makes you think it's precious? Maybe it's toxic. Somebody's trying to protect it. It might be. They're both, both protecting yeah, it. Even if it is toxic, they're protecting it because of their bottom line and that's precious to them. So it could all kind of tie back to the whole, well, something in the involved is precious. If you see a fence, is it a prison where you're enclosing something, or is it a castle where you're protecting something? Is it a treasure, or is it a punishment? Both. So in other words, this could be ambiguous, but somehow this fence makes you feel like somebody owns something, it's no longer, you're just free to wander around, it's restricted, and it's, it's trying to communicate. The fence is trying to communicate. I could say, don't go over there. But if there's no fence, it's like, yeah, why? And, and everybody will walk over there, right? That's what people do. <laughs> That's why fences happen. You know, back when I was a kid, it was like they promised us. When I was your age, we used to watch cartoons called The Jetsons. And they promised us that by the time they were my age, we'd be flying around in cars. But guess what? If you fly around in cars, fences mean nothing. So they don't let us fly around in cars because they want us to have fences, little fences, curbs, about this tall is enough to stop your car, <laughs> right? So somebody is controlling progress to keep us from going wherever we want and restricting and guiding. We have fences all around us, though we don't even see them, really. Okay, so remember everything about what you think of when you see a fence. I'm just going to go through a short series of images here. Let's suggest that you venture inside this fence, and the first thing you see right in front of you is a campfire. And there's some, there's some sticks making the fire. What does that speak? What does a campfire tell you? Somebody was here. Somebody was here. Okay, so it, 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 it seems to indicate habitation. So now this fence is not just some empty pasture, somebody, there's life here somehow. What else does it say? I couldn't hear the other words. I said it was active. Active. Something is actually being engaged. It's not abandoned. It's not like a ghost town. Something else? 
What if this what if this fire pit has a barbecue grill on it? Now what's that say? Is there food on there? <laughs> food. I mean, it, 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 whether there's food or not, Somebody indicates whether or not somebody's nearby. <laughs> Barbecuing. Okay, but think about one other thing. What was, what was, let's, let's just imagine a, imaginary, go back to the caveman days. What was, what was mankind's first invention? Fire. Fire. So the fact there's a fire in here indicates use of intellect and invention. And why did man invent fire? It's either, right, it's, it's survival against nature, so now man is using his intellect to contend, to fight against or defend against whatever nature's doing, the wind, the cold, or maybe wild animals at, at night, or maybe he's going to catch one of the animals and now instead of biting into a raw, he's going to cook it. So he's using his intellect to alter nature for his benefit. So this fire pit speaks of a lot of things. It's active, it's life going on, and it's a picture of humans contending with nature and winning the conflict. Harnessing a power of nature for his personal interest. Anything else anybody can see in a, in a fire with a barbecue grill? A place to dispose of unwanted things. Okay, so now you have more intellectual processing. The person is saying, I choose this, I choose not that. I need to get rid of this. I need to destroy this. What do I do? Fire. Then you now now that means you've had to observe nature and realize that fire is a tool. It's it's scary and it can ruin things, but if you harness it, you can use it to accomplish your purposes. This is all quite intellectual stuff just symbolized by this barbecue grill. Okay, another another image. So say you, you step and you see this fence, you see this barbecue grill, and you look up, and the next thing you see is a wash basin. With a little bit of uh, water in it. What does that make you think of? Be clean. Be clean. So somebody has to think of hygiene. Somebody, to be clean, somebody has to be able to look at themselves and assess I'm uncomfortable or I don't feel healthy. I think that if I clean myself, I'll be better off. It's, it's a matter of introspection. What, what else do you, might, might you think of? Hydration. Hydration, which means you have to know or at least start contemplating something about bodily functions. It's like, I remember here once, I, I heard this story that someone was saying, gosh, I have this weird feeling inside. Why? What is this? They, they didn't know what to do with this weird feeling. And as the story went on, it was a wealthy person, and the person they were talking to determined they were feeling hunger pangs. They'd never felt hungry before. They were so wealthy that they were always had everything they wanted, and it, it was strange. They didn't know what being hungry felt like. And it's like, that's pretty weird. Doesn't fit in my world, but the, what I'm saying is that to become aware of a need isn't taken for granted. It comes from some kind of an experience. So this, this bowl of water, if it's about being thirsty, you have to somehow know, gosh, I, I feel thirsty or I feel really wiped out. Maybe I need to drink something. Again, intellectualizing, self-realization, introspection, sense of hygiene, I've heard, I heard uh, th this one guy many years ago, he worked for the U.S. government in some capacity of international relations, and he went to, I think, some place over in Indonesia. And he says, you know, we go there not to say, come in and tell you, let me tell you how to do it. These people are already living their life. But he says, invariably, you'd find a village where a bunch of people were sick. They just, they just observe, and they get to know the chief of the village, and they talk to him a while, and he says, virtually every time. Pretty much they, they notice that the people are getting their drinking water from the same place as their latrine. Yeah. What's the matter with people? Don't they know? No, not necessarily. It's not necessarily intuitive. 
But when he would tell the guy, hey, look at if you can separate, put your wastewater over here and your drinking water from over here, people would get better. You didn't have to give them a bunch of pharmaceuticals. I mean, every once in a while you got to kill some parasites. But, but the point is, some things are just, that's the way it's done, but how do you know that? So some learning, some intellectual processing, some, something is, in other words, this isn't just a bowl of water. It's telling us that somebody is really processing themselves. They feel thirsty. They feel unclean. They feel like there's a remedy. So this, this almost speaks of remedy. Anything else that a bowl of water might speak to you? Well, since we just passed the fire pit, we may have to put the fire out and we're done. So having some more to so talk for that. There you go. It's another form of tool. Okay, what does a what does a bowl of water seem to represent? Containment. A containment. There's a whole other concept. What is contained in a bowl of water? water. You can water. contain a fish in a bowl of water. What about a pregnant woman? There, there's a there's a bowl of water with with something living in it. So this could this could almost speak of a of a maternal conception concept. Okay, here's, here's another. Say you've got a some type of a of a lamp, a candle, a, a torch of some kind burning. What is that? Say say you, say after you see this fire pit in the wash bowl, you see that there's this tent, kind of a, of a dwelling, and, and you look inside, and in the dwelling, there's, a, there's an illumination, there's a light. What does that mean? What does that speak? Occupied. Occupied. It's occupied, but you could occupy at night with no light. So it's not just occupied, but it's... It's a control over the dark. Somebody is controlling over the darkness... Enlightenment, illumination, that's more of a, of a psychological, philosophical term. Someone's alert. Being alert. Now this is a state of mind we're talking about. That's different than the barbecue grill or the fence or the, or the wash basin. You, you, you see what's, what's going on here? It's, it's, a, it's a different type of thinking is going on. There's a certain type of thinking when you see the fence. Another type of thinking... When you see the barbecue grill, there's another type of thinking when you see the wash basin. And now that there's light in a dark place, there's even another type of thinking. Anybody else got anything else from seeing an illumination? It allows, it, it allows you to do something. It allows you to carry on function. So when he says it's a tool to see, the interesting thing about tools is that those are intentionally made, right? So they, I remember when I was a kid, I remember hearing it said, well, only humans make tools. And it's like, that's not true. Birds make tools. Monkeys make tools. Dogs will even make a tool. They'll, they'll you know, besides just using their mouth to bite, they'll sometimes pick something up and do something. It's like, wow. That, that, but tool use shows highly developed, what would you call, uh, civilized or developed intellectually. I mean, so, so this means... If you see some, this is a picture like of a candle, but regardless of whether it's a torch or a candle, somebody had to figure out controlled fire even more than the fire pit. They also had to figure out how to keep it burning, slow, sustained, and use, and make a tool. This tool making inside this place. Okay, now say, say next to the, the light place, you see a table with some... Loaves of bread on it. Show bread. <laughs> it show is bread. <laughs> Say there's some, some, some loaves of bread there. What do you think if you see a table with some bread on it? What does that say? How fresh is it? I mean, that's my first thought is how fresh is it? Well, are you hungry? You want some? No, no, no. The point is, is if you see a table, there's different bread. It could be fresh bread. It could be old bread. So, am I, it, that, again, it plays to the occupied, not occupied. Is this something that could have been there for a while? Or is this hot, just came out of an oven, there's nobody standing around. But obviously, this place has been occupied recently. Okay, but if you see a table with a number of loaves of bread, does it, what does anybody else here see from this? That people are going to come. 
it's people. For somebody. More you than use one, the plural. More than one person. Yeah. More than one person. You right. see, this could have been a single habitation with a little bit of a light and a like a little tent. But if you see a table with a number of loaves of bread, it speaks of society. That's another way of thinking. We have tool use, social. The other one was a, like an introspection. The other one, like, oh, this is a compound of possession. Each one of these is a different type of thinking. Okay, let's say there's a, a dish with some incense burning. What does that make you think? A dish of incense burning, what do you think of? Where, did you, where does your mind go when you think of incense? Is it related to a religious act? Religion. Why should incense speak of religion? We have it in the Holy Place. Well, that's because you're now referring to the Bible in the book of Exodus. But History is what has been passed on through cultures that we've heard about from so if you were walking through the woods and you you smelled some sage burning, what would you think? Well, we might think it's a religious ceremony, but if we didn't have that background knowledge, it might just be a pleasant scent. might be a pleasant scent. I might think if I smelled some sage burning that there's some new age wackos hanging around here doing <laughs> smudging. Just kidding. I'm, I'm being facetiously disparaging. You know, I'm just saying that because sage smudge is more of a Native American thing, but it's also got religious connotations. They think they're driving demonic entities away. That's what they're doing. That's why they're doing it. And they also, that incense is associated with prayer. In fact, even the place in the Bible, there's a verse that says, the prayers of the saints are, 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 are arrive as incense to the to the. They're in a pleasant aroma to the Almighty. So prayer and incense kind of goes together, like you say. It's almost like just natural human consciousness to make that association. Okay, so say say now there's a there's a there's a curtain of some kind. Uh, blockade and on the back side there's this box it's a golden treasure box they say it's ornamented with, with, with gold what, what would you think if you saw a golden box hidden hidden behind a, a little curtained area in this room what is that saying what is that talking about treasure. Valuable. valuable treasure precious precious is it a useful tool? <laughs> tools might be precious, but you use tools. How do you use a treasure? <laughs> Only if you lose the treasure can you use the treasure. It's kind of like that thing, that French thing with Marie Antoinette. Oh, let them have, the, have their cake and eat it too. And it's like, you, you can't. If you spend your treasure, you no longer have it. Now, if you have stocks and bonds or Houses, you can, those are treasure, they're valuable, and you can say, I'm going to save these up, or even a collection of guitars, or a collection of cars, and when you're old, you start selling them off. So it's a, it's a, it's a saving plan. But if you have a treasure, it, it, it's only good as a treasure if you don't spend it. Once you spend it, it's somebody else's treasure, but it's not a tool. A tool is a different, a skill saw or a hammer is a different type of treasure. So this is a whole different way of thinking. But what does a treasure speak of? Yes, it's precious, it's valuable. That means you have to have this inner sense of balance. weight, measures, balance. What is a treasure good for? Curiosity, maybe, but what else? Trade. Huh? Trade. I can't hear you. Trade. Trading. Trading. Trading, well, that's what we were saying. You could, you could save it and use it in the future to cover something. But the fact that you're going to use it in the future means now you're thinking about time and time when right now I might be fit and maybe 10 years from now I get a little older I'm not so fit. I need to store something up. It's another way of thinking. Okay, now, let's assemble all these together. We have, we have a big fence with a gate. Inside the gate, there's a barbecue grill. Inside the barbecue grill, there's a, a 
basin of water. And then there's this other tent area inside, and inside you've got these four things. What message is communicated by these pictures? Let's go over them again real quick. And, and, and please feel free, there's no wrong answer. Think of this like one of those psychological Rorschach ink block tests. It's like, here's a splatter. What's it make you look like? I mean, what does it make you think about? What does it look like? A bug, a snowflake, a, you know, a, a porcupine. I mean, there's no wrong answer. I'm just trying to see what do these images make you think about? Well, it depends. Obviously, at some point, we're a little skewed. Once we start seeing all of it come together, that we see the tabernacle. Nah, forget the Bible. Well, this no, isn't no, no. about the Bible. Forget the Bible. Just, just forget the Bible. I understand. I'm saying it's tough not to see that. Okay, then he can't say anything. Anybody else <laughs> who's a little bit more free in their thinking? It has meaning and it has intent. Huh? It has meaning and it has intent. Somebody put it there intentionally, it has meaning to them, whomever put it. Okay, so somebody put this here. Now, you might stumble across this as you're walking through the wilderness, and you bump into this thing, and you go, hey, like, we drive into the parking lot, and hey, there's a round building, and hey, there's tables, and hey, there's a, there's a fire going on. So we just, and then suppose... Then as you're walking around, you, you open up, uh, you see a piece of paper, you pick up the piece of paper, and you realize, oh, these things are drawn on the piece of paper. Oh, it's like, oh, that's interesting. And you look over and you see a car, and there's a bumper sticker that has these same pictures on the bumper sticker. And you say, hey, that's the same pattern. Imagine that. And then you look up in the sky, and there's a cloudy day, and you see, wait a minute. The shapes of those clouds are the same sets of images. And then you see somebody walking by with a weird-looking hairdo, and you look at it and go, Gosh, that hairdo looks just like the, uh, the candle here. Or it's like, and then another person is wearing a t-shirt that has a picture of the, uh, the incense burner. And what I'm saying is you start noticing the same images again and again and again and again and again. And you think, something's going on. What are these images trying to communicate? So forget the Bible for a moment, just for the exercise. And I'm trying to say, if somebody... Who is that somebody? You don't know. It's a phantom. Someone it's created it. What? Someone created it. Yeah. Whoever designed this series of images did it on purpose. Yes. And if it keeps showing up, the more on purpose it might look. So the question is, what's it trying to tell us? If we go through the list, there was ownership. There was intellect and industry. There was introspection self-reference, cleaning, maybe maternity, then there's enlightenment, personal space of enjoying, enjoying socially, spiritually, and looking to the future. How would you put that all together? What is that actually saying? Can anybody put that in other words? Evidence. Evidence of what? Life. It is evidence of life, but what manner of life is this talking about? Evidence of order? Okay, there's, there is an order. If I was going to catalog the series of these pictures and what they mean, I could put them in a row and I could say, okay, which, which I kind of just did. I said, okay, the first one referenced. That's not the order I'm referring to. Oh, what order are you referring to? Order meaning there's just an an order, not a, not in order direct order. order, but like an organization of... Something's organized. Yeah, an organization, yeah. Somebody or something has a has a purpose for these things. There's, there's a... They're creating order out of chaos. Okay, what is the order? What is the, what is the purpose? Okay, he's saying that it's evident that these things are there on purpose, that they're trying to communicate. Well, like I said in the very beginning, if the Almighty, just like this fellow was saying, he says a couple words that I'm going, I don't know what you mean, so I have to ask him to reiterate. If the maker of this isn't around to tell us in other words, then somehow these images have to stand on their own, which means now I, he put the burden in communication, he spoke, and he put the burden of hearing on me. And I said, I don't know how to hear, and I threw it back on him. So he used different words, more words, to supplement the original communication. And what I'm suggesting is that the person 
the being, the creature, the space alien, whoever it was, that put these series of images here, if there's no other words, then the burden is on us to, a, to assess and determine and evaluate what message is this. So this is all, I'm, I'm saying all this for a reason, I'll tell you in just a moment, but, but real quick before I elaborate, what do you think the message is? And I'm not, don't, you can't say anything stupid or wrong. Don't feel like you're being on the spot. Just, I I have no unless you mention the Bible. Huh? That area might be occupied. Yes, the area is, the area is a place of living industry. Yes. It's occupied. It's what? a place, place of protection and sustain, uh, sustenance. Okay, so it's, it's, it's livable. It's, there's something sustaining in here and and it's protected so it's safe it's safe and sustaining and so, i'm sorry i didn't hear what you said oh it's a pattern of evidence to this creation the pa pattern of evidence of what creation what do you mean by that pattern of evidence of creation what i, I think what you're saying is that somebody created this yes. on purpose yes it, because there's a pattern and it, it, the pattern tells me that it's actually evidence <laughs> Which means it's trying to communicate. That, that's what we we're just saying. So the question is, what's it trying to communicate? It's trying to communicate on the one hand that somebody put it here on purpose so we know a communication event is happening and now we're trying to decipher. We're all being cryptologists. We're all being detectives here together. And, and just so you know, I can't prove any better than any of you what this means. I'm trying to figure out what this means. So I'm in the same boat as you all. I have a couple ideas, but as I said in the beginning, how do we know we're right? Whoever we is, if we as Baptists versus Presbyterians versus Catholics versus Orthodox versus Jews, how do we know we're right? Well, it's a gathering place. Okay, let me, let me just kick this up a notch. I'm going to suggest that this series of pictures is the plumb line is the tool, is the standard of measure by which we can know we're right. Now the question is, really? How does that work? How does it work? That's the question. There's a fence, a barbecue grill, a wash basin, a candle, a table of bread, incense, and a treasure box. If it was a tape measure, I'd know how to use it. If it was a plumb bob, I'd know how to use it. If it was a tuning fork, Ding. Oh, now I know how to make my guitar strings equal it by, t by tweaking the, the, the knob. But how in the world do I use this tool? Well, it, it's rectangular, so there's a, there's a, or a sequence. Well, not necessarily. It might be round. Don't count on it to be a rectangular. <laughs> well, yeah. They're not just things that pile on top of each other. There's a progression. You come to this. It's sequential. Then this, then this, sure. Then this. And it makes it causes us to wonder why are these things in the second enclosure? Okay, what's the answer to that? Well, we don't we wouldn't know yet. Okay, well the well that's where we're at. We know it's sequential, we know it's a message, but where we're at is let's interpret this. What is the answer? What is this saying to us? The word and instructions to go along with it. Is there a book of instructions? No, there's just these pictures. Right now, there's only these pictures. What are you saying? Enter. 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 Four. There's four. Light. Sustenance. Gold. Eternal. Church. Okay, so what he's saying is that this, the message that's being projected here to whoever stumbles across this fence is to say you are welcome to enter and if you do it's a place of life a place of protection a place of intellect a place of enlightenment a, it's a it's a place where there's treasure and it's a place where you'll be able to have a spiritual connection with other people and you will be re refreshed and cleansed is that what we're is that what we're seeing? Okay, now let's think about this. I'm going to crank things up another notch and say, do you know which space alien, when I say space alien, non-terrestrial, no earthly, do you know which space alien invented this? No, we don't. There's no name. 
It could be anybody. It could be from Mars. It could be from Jupiter. It could be from Andromeda. We don't know that. But somebody put this here to communicate in this place you will find handed to you, offered to you, and maybe if you could smell the barbecue grill, you go, boy, have you ever smelled a barbecue from far away? I was working on a job the other day and saying, man, somebody's cooking something and it makes you, boy, I wish I could be invited over there and just kind of draw in that direction. Something is welcoming, bringing you in, and offering you a society of enlightenment, spiritual treasure, refreshment, cleansing. And guess what? What I noticed in the Paleo-Hebrew is that the Moedim of yod heh vav -Hey are symbolized by these pieces of the Mishkan. The fence represents Pesach. The barbecue grill represents Hag HaMatzot. This festival of Shavuot is represented by the laver. Yom Teruah by the menorah, the candlestick, the place of light. Yom Kippur by the table of showbread, Sakot by the altar of incense, and then in a set-apart place, the day of Shemini Atzeret by the Ark of the Covenant, the treasure box. Now think about that. If we read the Bible in Exodus between chapters 25 and 35, we'll see Moshe was told to make a mishkan, a tabernacle. The word mishkan is place of shekin. That's where you get the word shekinah, which means presence, is glory. But it's also to be neighbors. This place for, for people to congregate together and hang out is a mishkan. To go to your local tavern is a mishkan. Tavern, it comes from the Greek word taverno. The B and the V transpose vowel I mean, consonantal sounds. So it's where you get the tavern, tabernacle. Tabernacle and tavern, place where you drink beer and throw darts and shoot pool. It's all the same word. The place the neighbors hang out together. So the point is, Moshe was told, make everything according to the pattern. The word pattern in Hebrew is spelled tav, bet, nun, yod, tav. Tabeni. This is T, B, N, Y, or I, T. And it's read right to left, cabinet. If I had made this a C, it would be a cabinet. Oh, cabinet. A cabinet is a box you put things in. Well, a cabinet is a pattern, and the pattern is something you put things in. What do you put in a pattern? Ideas. I, a pattern is something, like my mom when I was a kid, she used to get patterns and she'd make clothes. She'd get them from J.C. Penney or I think McCall's or something. So she'd take this pattern, if somebody says, hey, I think this is a good idea, and she'd get some fabric, and she'd get her sewing machine, and she'd make clothes for the family. A pattern is a way to take this person's idea and get it over here exactly the same. So when you were trying to communicate, and I didn't understand your words, there was no communication. Something failed. If this seven-object message fails to communicate, there's no communication. It failed. Which means either the communicator, the one who designed this speaking, did a bad job, or me, the audience listening, did a bad job if I can't receive the message. I'm suggesting that the seven Moedim are not just Jewish holidays. That the pieces of the tabernacle are not just fixtures inside the building but they represent items which will cause us to think a certain way. Shaul mentioned thinking like a Hebrew. How do you do that? How do you think like a Hebrew? Right to left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, wait a minute, we're supposed to go to the left? You can't, you can't be static right then. You, you must be in moving. Verbal, verbs. You need to quit thinking Greek. Quit thinking, how do you think Greek? You know what Alexander the Great did, the Macedonian, the great Greek who conquered the world? You know what he did when he conquered the people group? He changed the language. What else did he change? Culture. Culture. How did he change culture? Customs. Customs of what? Sports and entertainment. Okay, so by changing the language, 
holidays, customs, sports and entertainment, you create a new civilization, a new culture, a whole different mind and heart of people, and so you can take a captured people and make them your own. The U.S. government did that to the Native Americans throughout the 1800s, the later 1800s, 1900s of, of this country. And they're still about the business of doing it. We won't address that. It, it, it's virtually criminal unless you're trying to take over, eradicate, which is to say annihilate some previous culture. So there's an interesting verse in the Bible, chapter 2 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, has a dream. It's an astounding dream, but he wakes up and he can't remember it. But he, he goes, that was a great dream. But doesn't know what it means, doesn't know what it is. So he calls in his wise men, his Chaldeans, his magi, his sorcerers, his guys that are supposed to be in touch, seer prophets. You know, they know what's happening in the heavenlies. And he says, if you guys are really who you say you are, you're going to tell me what was the dream I had and what does it mean? And they said, come on, king. No king has ever asked that of his wise men. You tell us the dream and then we'll make up, I mean, we'll tell you what the vision really means. <laughs> He says, no, that's not the way it's going to work. You're going to tell me what dream I had, or else you're all liars, and I'm going to kill you all. Execute every one of you guys. Which he started doing. And then somebody told Daniel, hey, man, we're all in big trouble. We're going to be dead in a few minutes. And Daniel said, tell the king to slow down. Take a breath. Let me, let me appeal to Yahweh. So Daniel says, hey, you, yod heh vav -Hey, the Elohim of Israel, you know the dream he had. Would you please tell me? Daniel was given an affirmative answer. So he goes to the king and he says, Hey king, this is the dream. You saw a vision, a, a statue, head of gold, arms of silver, midsection, bronze, legs of iron, feet mixed with iron and clay. What's it mean? You, O king, are the head of gold, the Babylonian kingdom. After you will come another kingdom, not quite as glorious, silver, media Persia. After them, Greece, bronze, midsection. Like I said, arts and entertainment, like the guts, arms, or like arms of uh, military arms. And then you have the word silver in Hebrew is shekel, which also means to buy and sell. So it's the arms represented, you might say, commerce and military. The intelligentsia of Babylon, where you get into education and science and, you know, heady things, military things, cultural things. And what came out of Rome? Regal politics and religion, Christianity and Islam, it's like, and then there's these feet, iron mixed with clay, they're not cohesive, <clears throat> looks to me kind of like the days of democracy, when, when things are yet different, but, but if, if we think, oh yeah, these are just sequential, chronologically ordered, there was Babylon, then Media Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then the Holy Roman Empire, and now the, the monarchies of Europe have disbanded, and it's pretty much making this world safe for democracy. That's kind of like everybody, uh, you know, kind of like the toes, kind of like the iron mixed with clay. We're cohesive, but we're not. There's infighting, there's civil wars. But it's like, wait a minute. That wasn't the end of the vision. Then there was a rock. Comes from some mountain, not hewn by human hands, or cut from the mountain, and it hits the, hits the feet, and this whole statue just <clears throat> crashes down, fragments, turns to dust, and blows away. And then the stone becomes this mountain, that won't yield its sovereignty to another, as if it's the last kingdom on the face of the earth. So the question is, if we are wanting to think like a Hebrew, is this the roadmap, the plan, of how to think like a Hebrew? Well, if it's correlated to the Moedim, how does Yahuwah establish the Hebrew-minded <coughs> culture? with his Moedim. We are at the labor counting 50 days. Well, Mem, Mem Nun line up with this labor. Mem is a womb, is water, and it's the number 40. Human gestation is 40 weeks. Noon is 50. Noon is like the baby being birthed out of the womb. Noon is the, the, the Jubilee, the Yovel, the year 50. It's today, Shavuot, day 50, jumping out of the series of counting seven sevens. We are right now experiencing the epitome, the peak, the finality of this Moed. 
that we